So if we see something that we believe could be a threat, we will release that information, we will take whatever protective steps are necessary, we will go to the public, we will walk door to door, which we did in both instances. So the aqueduct does actually more physical monitoring events than we do, but we do thousands as well. It is on our website so you can see it. So WASA would once again have the um, task of informing residents if in fact there was some reason, uh, for something for them to know. There, yes, we, we believe we have the responsibility as the distributor of the water to, to inform our customer. There may be occasions where the aqueduct as well, does as well, but we take that responsibility very seriously on our part and we'll do it in every way we can to make sure the citizens know exactly what's happening as soon as we know. There are very, I'm sorry, me, there are very strict rules in the Safe Drinking Water Act that require utilities to coordinate with EPA within hours of any treatment or other event that falls into a, a whole range of categories and then a decision is made very quickly of, of what kind of notice should uh, be Mr. made. Uh, Jacobus, I'm, I'm not concerned, uh, frankly, that people didn't find out. I know one thing, they didn't find out for four, the public didn't find out for four years. I'm concerned about public information now. Mr. Hawkins has said, as in, as was the case before, it, it, it is the job of WASA. WASA, which had a marvelous reputation because the agency had to be rebuilt, until that time really did much to spoil its reputation by taking actions that could only be called um, cover-up uh, actions. Now, Mr. Zalou, the public needs to know why it is you, for example, are the lead agency uh, on the lead prevention work and not, as is usually the case, the public health agency and a local jurisdiction. How did that happen, and what is what what, what is your well uh, the the key uh, the key response in terms of dealing with prevention that came out of this experience in 2003 was the realization that we had too many agencies of the district government involved in the process. So if there was a problem, it took forever to actually get some response. The old way is the Department of Health would uh, receive a report from a uh, blood test screen. Uh, they would make a report to DDOE, which would follow up to check to see whether or not there was a cause of concern within the home of the child that had the elevated blood level. And then if that was the case, then DDOE would send a report over DCRA, which is a consumer um, regulatory uh, administrator, to uh, actually enforce. Uh, so what has happened in 2008 with the, uh, uh, the law that the, uh, the council and, and, and passed and the, and the mayor signed is to consolidate all those responsibilities within DDOE. Uh, one of the primary reasons for that is that this is indeed an environmental threat. Uh, it has to do with and a public health threat. Well, it's a public health implication, but if you have uh, peeling paint in a home or you have uh, lead in the water, uh, then in essence, and you know, there's no real reason why it would have to be an environmental agency. It just needs to be an agency that is willing to step up, realize that there's a problem and take action. Um, we have been designated that agency. I have to give uh, Mr. Hawkins a great deal of credit for having made DDOE the kind of agency that can respond as well as it does to these sorts of things. Uh, and to the folks sitting behind me who have made it their life's work to make sure that we discover where the problem is and we take action to deal with it. Dr. Arias, um, I, I have an, another question for you. Um, uh, in light of your testimony at page seven, where you say that the rate of elevated blood levels um, was actually lower when the CDC uh, included the newer, uh, the, the new evidence, evidence that was not uh, available uh, to you before. Did these findings account for the residents or the households who knowingly, um, uh, knowing perhaps that they had lead service lines or high, high levels of lead in the water, had switched, therefore, to drinking bottled or filtered water? Uh, there were people who didn't know. Those were the people who were particularly panicked. There were others who had switched because a lot of people were switching uh, during that period uh, to, to drinking water that it, we're told often is the same water that comes uh, to us out of the pipes. Uh, did you, were you able to account for those who had switched and, and, and therefore might be 
uh, in the sample as well? The information that we added when we did the reanalyses was information back from um, the, the initial exposures. Uh, we did have information about who was drinking uh, tap water, um, but we did not have information about who had switched to bottled water or was drinking bottled water. And there was no way to find that out? I mean, are those people perhaps in the sample? I would have to check with I, we would have to check the raw data. I'd have to check with my colleagues back at CDC and look at that more closely. I would appreciate your doing that mm -hmm. and, and, and providing information to the um, subcommittee within 30 days. Uh, looking again at your testimony, page 8, you indicated that among the data that was missing in 2004 were results from 100 children, you say, who had elevated blood levels in 2003. Um, how many of, the, uh, of these children were tested uh, for poisoning in 2003, and how many of them had elevated blood levels? The, the 100 are the ones who, according to those tests, appear to have elevated blood levels that, be, that is above 10. Um, when we then followed up with the department uh, in the district, it turns out that there were uh, five children, um, I think it was I don't remember if it was, no, I'm sorry, there were three children who actually had uh, low le lower levels than that, were below 10. 95 percent, uh, 95 percent, 95 of the children did have elevated blood levels between 16 and 28 uh, micrograms uh, per deciliter. Those 95 children had received appropriate services and case management, uh, so that they, it was documented that they had received uh, appropriate case management. There were two children uh, who, one was a resident of the embassy, uh, and we don't have information about them, although we, we assume that uh, they got the appropriate services through uh, their uh, contacts and their providers. And then there is one child who the department has not been able to uh, locate and find out what the follow-up was uh, after the positive test. How many total tests of children were taken? I would have to get that information to you. I would don't know the exact number. Sure. Within 30 days uh, to, the, to the chair of the subcommittee. Mm -hmm. um, some have suggested that that's, uh, indeed this is why I asked the earlier question about who monitors. It sounds like it's self-monitoring. Is there any reason to believe that there should be some um, independent oversight of uh, water in the District of Columbia? Independent of the people who are in charge of delivering it. Uh, Dr. Arias, I mean, would that be a good practice uh, to do in any case? All of our lead programs are required to create coalitions uh, of all of the agencies and then interested parties in, in those districts who have a role and have an interest uh, in the quality of water and then the whole uh, issue of lead. So we are in favor of providing that sort of type of oversight. The coalitions essentially are responsible for reviewing the programs, the activities that Who's are responsible? I'm sorry, the coalitions you... that are created uh, by the uh, lead programs. They're responsible for then uh, essentially overseeing the programs, making recommendations about changes, uh, working with us uh, in doing that as well. Um, Mr. Hawkins, um, how many partial lead replacements have taken place? in the District of Columbia this year, for example? Uh, I, I will get you the exact number this year. In fiscal year 2009, uh, the number was about 350. Um, so part, 350 in 2009. 2009, 2010, I can get you the number. By way of contrast, when the program was full steam, it was doing 2,500 partial lead lines in a year. And those were done on purpose for the reason of replacing the lead lines as opposed to as incident with a water main replacement. Although I'm going to say, you keep saying that, Mr. Hawkins, but in the light of what we know, it doesn't matter the reason. Because whatever the reason, as you, you earlier testified, you're going to tell people what to do Absolutely. to mitigate the lead issue. So I understand that you, that okay. you, you at least weren't doing them uh, in, in order uh, to um, control uh, the um, 
the lead in the water. Could I ask if after our hearings in 2004, WASA, WASA continued to do uh, these partial replacements on the, on the theory that it would control lead in the water? WASA continued doing partial lead replacements. Uh, I actually do have the letter from the CDC informing us of the study you mentioned. It was in September of 2009. It was September of 2008 when the Board of Trustees, because it had been a board level resolution to do, uh, to support this program, which had initially been a requirement of the lead copper rule by US EPA. So the initial response. Now, is it a, is it, do you regard it as a requirement today? It is not a requirement today. Once the sampling that had been done showed that the, the numbers of lead in water had gone below the action level for a period of time, then EPA removed the requirement that we had to do lead, partial lead service line requirements. When they removed the requirement, we had all this new information showing that it was not working, in fact, was not achieving its desired goal. Well, well what made EPA think it was working? Pardon me? You know, if EPA was mandating partial uh, replacement on the basis of what scientific evidence were they proceeding? This is very troublesome. We had some problems on the national level with CDC. Now you tell me the EPA said do partial lead replacement with something that almost common sense would have told you. If you knew anything, as of course um, uh, professionals do, uh, might lead to leaching or leaking of lead. Do you understand? No. Does any, can anyone tell me what the source of, of that recommendation was in the first place to do partial lead replacement? I mean, partial pipe replacement? Well, I, I can speak not to the theory behind it, but in fact, in the lead and copper rule, if a system exceeds the 90th percentile at 15 parts per billion, which is the, the action level threshold in the lead and copper rule, in addition to public notification, it must begin a partial system replacement of 7%, I think, of the lines per year until the system achieves compliance at the, of, of the 100 samples taken uh, in a six month period at the 15 parts per billion. So it was a formula worked out in the lead and copper rule to cause a system to begin to replace service lines, if only partially, and at the same time to reestablish corrosion control. Now the, the, the scientific theory behind that I cannot speak to. Ms. Selbegel? Yes, I was on the SAB committee and I'm afraid it was a political science consideration more than an engineering science. It had to do, and I think uh, you spoke to this as well, part of this problem is because the sources of lead can be within private property and within public property. And at the time of the uh, evaluation of recommendations to EPA for the Safe Drinking Water Act and the lead and copper rule, there was a reluctance to try to engage the political issues that would arise if recommendations were made that the private sector of the lead line might have to be replaced as well. If I could just finish this question. That, but, but did they know at the time that if you did only replacement of one part of the line, uh, that that would perhaps be harmful and therefore why, why recommend any replacement? I don't think that it was clearly known that re partial replacement would potentially actually increase levels. There was some sense that any reduction of lead in the system would tend to reduce levels of lead overall. So that was not an issue of scientific knowledge or assumption, but the main driver, I would have to tell you, based on my recollection, was political rather than scientific. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentlelady. Uh, I appreciate you taking over the responsibilities of, of the chair uh, during votes. It helped us, uh, I think, utilize our time well. Uh, I just want to, I had a number of questions here, but I, I think in my absence we were able to ask a few of them, so I, I don't want to, uh, is this okay? Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, Based on testimony that was given earlier today, uh, as I understand it, uh, the CDC has taken issue with the fact that the district only tests approximately 38 percent of, of children so far. And, uh, I, and I, this sort of relates to my earlier question about is it smart, given the history here, to, to only test children up to age six? Uh, obviously, 
given the history, we'd like to see 100% uh, of the kids tested, the children tested. Uh, how, how do we get there and uh, how, how close are we to, to getting where we need to be? Mm -hmm. And, and um, as I mentioned earlier, we know that only about 45% of the kids, even between the ages of one and two, who are at the highest risk uh, are being tested. One of the things that we're doing is working very closely with the district to make sure that enforcement of that law uh, for universal screening in that age group, number one, is being conducted. The reason for starting with the high risk kids is the obvious reasons. We want to make sure that they are optimally protected. However, in addition to them making sure that kids who are at the highest risk are tested, we want to make sure that others as well. So even going up to the age of three, especially a child who's three years old and has never been tested, making sure that that child is tested, catching them again before they enroll either in daycare or at school and making sure that they get tested at that time. Ms. Arias, what, what puts a child into a high risk uh, category? The, the age number one, um, and given that they are most likely to suffer significant health effects as a result of even low exposures or any exposure associated with lead. Right. Again, because their brains are still developing so rapidly during that time, so that I, we use I understand. Ages. I guess it's risk of exposure uh, is to is to what I'm what I'm getting at. Uh, prior to being a member of Congress, I, I actually uh, did a lot of volunteer legal work for in public housing. Basically, I grew up in the housing projects. And, uh, and ended up representing a lot of the families that I used to live with. Uh, you know, and they had lead paint. Mm -hmm. They had asbestos on the pipes. Uh, some of the, mm -hmm. the housing was uh, substandard, to say the least. And uh, are we targeting any populations like uh, people that are, uh, families that are in uh, public ha older public housing developments that uh, might be at greater risk? We are targeting them through various in, in various ways, and one of the things that we are working very hard to do is making sure that those homes get assessed very carefully, looking at all sources of lead. So looking at water, looking at air quality, looking at other kinds of things that also may increase exposure to lead in those homes. Okay, but right now we're only getting 38 percent. And so do we have a plan in place? Is that a goal? Uh, are we, we testing 38 because we're looking for a sampling? No, we're, we're, the only reason 38 are being tested is because we have to step up and make sure that individuals who should be doing the testing are going to do it, children who should be tested are going to be tested. So it's a matter of providing both the education and the oversight to make sure that the laws that are in place, the regulations that are in place, are being enforced and are being carried out. Okay. Let me ask, uh, Dr. Silbergeld, you, you raised some concerns around this, this same area. Uh, what, what's your read on this in terms of our inability to, to really get a, 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 a more complete assessment of, of, of the risk to these children? That's a very complicated question. I'm glad you're pursuing it. Um, as pointed out, CDC has consistently made the recommendation for universal screening. And I also would note that I think your questions about extending the point of screening beyond six is something that should be taken under advisement by CDC as well. The problems really arise that this is actually implemented on a state level. And the funding through national health programs is limited. And therefore, it's decisions that are made on the basis of health priorities by various states. At present, relatively few states, I believe Dr. Arias, have actually legislated universal screening. My state is one of them. We're not achieving that yet either. And a lot of it does involve speaking with the health care community, private and public, in terms of ensuring that this message goes out. But this is an issue, I think, of the very highest priority. And anything that can be done to stimulate a more attention to this, I think, would be very welcome by everyone in public health. Mr. Chairman, could, could uh, I'm going to yield. yield yeah, I, I, I'm just about done. So I, I would yield. Uh, I, I just have a question, lady. just to follow up your question. I, I don't. While you were going, I don't think I had heard that 38 percent numbers. I, I, the chairman's question about 38 percent made me wonder, Mr. Tulu, why in the world the district has such a low number, especially in light of the fact that it is here that you had a national lead in the water crisis, where you would have expected us to. 
to have a larger number tested for paint and for water and wherever lead comes from? Well, actually, I must say, uh, taking a national view, and one of my students has just reviewed this, and I'm sorry to say this as an American, but that's at the upper end of prevalence of testing in the United States. There are some states where they're we're down around 10 or 15 percent. But Mr. Tulu, I, I, I want to know how, you know, if, if we're supposed to have universal testing here and we can only get to 38 uh, well, percent? Well, we're supposed to have universal vaccination and we don't get that either. So we, we have, you know, better than I of the Tulu. problems of delivering health. Let me hear from Mr. Tulu. We had the crisis and we got 38 percent. I think it sounds awful. I don't care compared to whatever. And I'd like to know why we don't have a higher figure than that. Yeah, and I think the, the point's very well taken. We in the district, by the way, do have a law that requires testing twice of, of young children before they're the age two. Uh, one of the things I mentioned in the testimony that we're doing is working with uh, Medicaid officials on some data sharing, which will uh, help us to make sure that Medicaid children are at least getting their testing on time which in other jurisdictions has led to very significant increases in that screening rate. Um, but it's, it's like a lot of other m mandates. Uh, if there is a reluctance on the part of the, the health providers to do this for whatever reason, you would think the health officials would be the first ones to want to test their patients for these things. Uh, it creates somewhat of a problem, uh, and it's obviously something we're aware of and would like to improve those numbers as well. Just one other point. I believe um, that the city of Providence instituted a program whereby children had to present evidence of having been tested for lead prior to school entry, including preschool, and that has had a dramatic effect on increasing the rates of testing. So there are other actions that can be taken by jurisdictions. Again, not something that CDC mandates, but ways of linking this very, in a very real way to the risks of school failure. That may be the answer right there. Uh, thank you. That's, that's very helpful. Uh, Madam Chair, I'll yield five minutes to you, if you'd like. I'm, I'm, I'm to ask all of my questions and even all some right. of yours. Thank you very much. Okay. <laughs> uh, and, and, and again, uh, Mr. Tulu, uh, the, the lack of compliance, if we're looking for universal testing, wh where's the log jam here? If we're at 38 uh, percent, is it, is it because we're not making families aware or we're not making providers aware? Where, where is this, where are we falling down on this? I think it's, uh, we have a fairly considerable amount of effort going on to make the healthcare providers aware. Uh, what we have found in our experience is that they sometimes, for whatever reason, don't particularly want to listen to us uh, in this regard. Uh, I think there is general authority under the law for the district to enforce against those who are not um, providing the screening. Uh, I don't think that that has been rolled out and has not been used. Uh, certainly we're open to other ideas too to find ways to, to encourage this, uh, these uh, tests to, to happen. If it relates to entry into school, I think part of the downside of that is that kids are already well beyond their second year of age by the time that they're looking for entry yeah. into school or preschool programs, yeah. uh, but certainly that would be a way down the line to, to find out whether or not that testing had occurred. You would think, though, that um, newborns, uh, you know, just checkups in those, those very early uh, months and years that given the circumstances here, we had, we had a, a crisis from 2000 to 2004, so this isn't just a general population. This is a population that we've already identified as having some considerable risk. Uh, and, and the exposure possibilities are, are there. So now we're responding to that by, by trying to institute this, this testing. Uh, you, you would think there would be a greater urgency among uh, providers to, to make sure, whether it's a health center uh, community health centers, uh, you know, see a lot of these children, uh, whether or not uh, they're aware of this and, and uh, are taking the opportunities to test these kids when they do come in. Uh, you know, I'm just not sure 
where, where the gap is. And I'm, I'm well, Mr. Chairman, I'm, I'm dumbfounded. Uh, yeah. Given the experience that D.C. had uh, back in that period of time, uh, that this isn't much higher on providers' list of concerns. I have to say for kids who tend to be at highest risk, there are a lot of other health issues that providers are dealing with them and their families on. Uh, but uh, I can assure you that we're going to go back and we're going to take a look at those numbers and we're going to find a way to, to bring those numbers up. Yeah. You know, I, I, I do agree with the doctor that making it a condition of uh, enrollment in school is, is one way, but considerable, as you pointed out, considerable time goes by uh, that there may be damage being done. Let, let me say just another thing that, uh, that I mentioned in my statement is we are being very proactive. We are identifying through a combination of GIS and places where we've noticed high blood levels in the past to find hot spots in the district. And we are going to those properties and making sure that those owners and managers of those properties are inspecting their, uh, their units uh, for, for uh, hazards. Uh, also now we are, when we respond to an elevated blood level and we're inspecting a home, we're also checking the water. So in other words, the bottom line here is there are a lot of different ways that a child's blood level could be high for lead. We don't want any of those opportunities and any of those uh, ways of, of introducing blood into their systems uh, to go unchecked. Historically, of course, peeling and, and flaking paint was a, an obvious one. Uh, the law now says that if that is happening in a pre-1978 home, it is assumed that that is a hazard. And so it's up to that property owner and that manager of that property to prove to us that it's not. Uh, so we enforce against them and we make sure that those cleanups are done. Uh, but by adding the water monitoring to the other environmental checks that we do within those homes is going to give us a helpful check to what the aqueduct and what uh, George is doing at, at WASA uh, on whether and to what extent water is a, a part of that situation. And Mr. Chairman, could I, uh, Please. Uh, just on, following up on your 38 percent question, when my children uh, were born, and you, you have to take children to the hospital, I mean to the doctor all the time in those years, um, it's mandated and people do it. I didn't remember knowing to ask the doctor what things um, John and, and Catherine Norton should have to immunize them. That wasn't from me, it was from him. And he would say, Ms. Norton, you do in two months for this child to have X, Y, Z vaccination. Why does the, 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 um, the District of Columbia not solve this problem by saying to health professionals, this is on your list uh, to tell a family uh, is required. Now we know that there are certain, you can refuse certain kinds of vaccinations and we, and we get in a lot of trouble for that. But why isn't that uh, simply added to the list of shots, shall I call them, like the polio shot, all the rest of them, the th diphtheria, all of that, and lead in the water, particularly because the District of Columbia has had uh, an, an issue on that. And it is on the list, and that's why I'm mystified. I don't understand why the physicians aren't requiring this, those tests to be done for those children. I guess you don't know then whether the other tests are being done either, because if it's on the list, you now scare me. Well, and I think that's right. And if I were a, a parent of a child going to the doctor, I would want to know what's on the list, and then I would ask the provider. Um, reclaiming my time. It, you, you know, I'm going to ask Mr. Hawkins and Mr. Jacobus if you could uh, just amplify around this point that we're talking about. Was there any effort to do a public communications campaign, you know, radio, TV, on the metro, anything to say you need to be testing your child, given the history we've had here, you need to be making sure that your child, you know, within these ages needs to be tested for, for uh, uh, lead levels. Uh, we've done uh, a very extensive outreach uh, about lead in water and what is the risk factors. One of the areas that we share with the Department of Environment is trying to be proactive in profiling where the problem is most likely to exist so we can focus our resources most intently. 
identifying either neighborhoods, streets, types of buildings, age of buildings, where should we focus our time, but to all our customers and all of what we distribute, we have information about the risk of lead and water. I don't think, although I'll check, that we've included recommendations on getting tested lead and blood for uh, children. And that's something that's a good idea that we could add, because we do regularly communicate, unlike many other agencies, because we send a bill. We communicate with our customers every month that we can add that, and that's a good idea. That, that would be helpful. Uh, and if you could make sure we communic you communicate with the, the committee, 